Um, so next, I'm about to dive into thinking particles and show the show a setup how how easy and fast it can be to create a jointing system or for the you know Houdini and Maya user constraints. Um, so before we go there, sh um, do you guys have any questions on the topic so far that I should answer first? Um, actually, I, I don't have the actual scene files. I mean, that's, you know, you can't take stuff home from production. Um, the setup that I'm going to create is not exactly a cage system. It's very similar. Basically, once you understand this, you can pretty much build us any kind of cage you want. How to learn thinking products? Well, yeah, um, online um, and learning by doing. Um, Said, uh, when you say fresher, do you mean fresher in TP or effects in general or max like 3D in general? Fresh and TP. Okay. Um, and effects. Um, I will come. Actually, I'm I'm gonna cover this at the very end. Um, I think. Let me check. Um, Where to start with effects? So yeah, if you want to start effects, learning effects, I would suggest get yourself an idea, maybe watch a movie and see an effects. That's what happened to me. I saw, I watched the matrix, I saw the helicopter, crashing into the building and the wave going through the building and the whole thing was exploding and that's when i was like i i want to do this i gotta do this and then you know it didn't look like in the movie i mean it was actually a practical effect but just trying to do this gave me so much um new knowledge like i learned first of all, i learned about thinking particles then from thinking particles it went you know um, to Fume and, and Krakatoa and MaxScript. And basically, the more you deal with it, the more you will learn. The more you, you have questions, the more you're going to be in the forums, and the more you're going to learn. And, you know, practice by doing. Set yourself a goal with a, with a project. And don't, don't be disappointed if it doesn't look the way you want, it, you want it to look. You know, it's a process, and you will get there. Um, what are the system requirements for thinking products? I think that is a question for Cebus, but usually, as long as you have Max running, thinking particles is going to be running. Or basically, Windows, you have to have Windows um, at Max. Do you guys have any questions on the specific stuff I talked about so far? So basically, so far, it wasn't technical. It was more about projects and the effects industry. Um, here's a question by Vishal. Um, the clean plate artist in Prime Focus, should I move to TP? I am not sure what a clean plate artist is, but if you want to do effects and particle work, why not? Just give it a try. Um, if you think it's, if you enjoy doing it, yes, absolutely. The only reason why you should move to TP and thinking particles is either because you want to learn another software or because you don't want to do effects or CG. But other than that, just go for it. Great. You can do it. I think match move artists have a very strong mathematical mind. They have to understand like camera and all of these angles. I have no, I have no idea about match moving, but you you guys definitely are made for you know particle systems because there's 
there can be quite a lot of mathematics involved, also in crowds, um, crowd simulations. Like, yeah. Okay, this is uh, quite an interesting question. So, um, you said it is important to have a skill of having an idea of how water or wind behaves or airplane behaves in air. How should we aesthetically uh, think when we need to work on fantasy lands or some alien planet? How should we, how should be the approach to gather references on particle activity? Well, um, I, I really like this question. So you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, you're saying because on different planets we have a different gravity, like on the moon, the gravity is I think 60% or something. So things behave differently. Um, how should we gather reference for that? This is a good question. Um, I mean, you could have a look how astronauts prepare for space, for example, like they go into water tanks or they go into centrifugal um, kind of, you know, machines that create big G forces. So stuff like, you know, sticks to the wall. Um, so this is where you could go and have visual reference or, you know, move like um, if there is any space footage material by NASA, you can check that out. Um, but to be honest, that's not where I would start. I mean, I would look at that for sure. But if you look at the movies nowadays, the viewer needs to be able to understand what, it's, what he's seeing. And sometimes they, they actually go exactly for the physical um, behavior in space. And it becomes confusing because your mind and your eye is used to stuff you know, on, on this planet and to our gravity, to our physics. And then in, if in, in the movies, things happen. Like, for example, there's like this uh, old Kung Fu movies where the guys are like running and, and like they're fighting in air. Like it's a skill that they have. They can, you know, defy gravity. And it's really fun to watch and it's really cool, but it feels a little bit unnatural. It feels like uh, it, it's like the physics don't add up. So you have to kind of connect with the viewer. What is he going to feel? Um, and I think that's very, yeah. So movies, Interstellar or Gravity, um, this was like, yeah, things are floating in air. There's basically no, no gravity except centrifugal forces. So when something is spinning, it gets pushed outside. So it creates kind of a, a gravity away from the center of, of rotation. But other than that, there wasn't a gravity. But again, you need to make sure the user, when he sees it, he has to feel that this is real. He has to kind of feel, okay, this 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 makes sense. Um, otherwise, it's just gonna feel like oh, pff, crazy. So, yeah, heavy scientific research. I I really like the question. That's a that's a pretty difficult task for the visual. Um, making the visual look look correct for the viewer and, and you know, um, good question. I hope I could, I was able to answer it to some degree. Um, we, will, uh, we will have a look how to apply for jobs later and how to make yourself interesting to companies. But yes, uh, I agree with you that um, it might be more difficult in some areas in the world than in others to get a job. And yes, native puppets. Right. What are the limitations in TP as compared to Fumatex and Rayfire? Um, um, all right, well, okay, last, I'll, I will answer, I will ask, answer this question, last questions. Um, so what are the limitations TP as compared to Fumafax and Rayfire? Well, TP is a particle system. Fumafax is a fluid uh, volume based fluid simulation tool. And Rayfire is for cutting. Well, I have been using it mainly for cutting geometry. It can simulate stuff, um, but it's, it's not 
it doesn't have the, the node based system like thinking part of it. So you can do crazy great stuff. And it uses, I think now it uses Mass Effects in Max. It, before it was using the reactor, whatever, uh, the Havoc and whatever it was in old Max. But yeah. Um, so these are three different tools. And everyone has its strengths and weaknesses. But as a effects artist, I would suggest use of all of them. I mean, Fume and TP are a very, very strong combination. And then Rayfire lets you do really, really great stuff to prepare stuff um, for the use with thinking particles and Fume. So all the three are great tools and I think should be used in combination. And then um, the last question that I will answer now is, what is the most challenging part in 2012 and 300? So for me, um, in 2012, I had to do the ground. And the, the funny part is the biggest challenge was cutting the ground. And um, Rayfire did a really good job here. It was helping a lot. But then we had to add other tools as well. So this was really hard because there were no really good artistic cutting tools back then. And then simulating thinking particles just made it more easy for us to simulate. But then Joe Scar did like big building collapsing, like the, the garage that we saw before on the right side, that was uh, his simulation. I think that involved a lot of joints. And it was pretty, pretty intense. And then also at the end of that sequence, there's a green glass building that kind of collapses and it kind of bends and falls. And I think that was the most challenging parts of uh, of our sequence. And then on 300, um, I think the two big challenges were, first of all, simulating those ships. Um, again, for me, like, I know the water was a big challenge too, because it was so much of it. It was such a big project. Um, so, so many simulations. But then for us was like, being able to simulate fast and have a st steady result, like have something solid that we can rely on. No surprise, no, no, oh, why is this exploding now? Why it just, you know, we had to have something that uh, was re reliable and fast and thinking particles again did a great job. Uh, and then of course, the vast amount of shots. I mean, we had like, I think se around 700 shots to do, not in effect, just to jerk the whole project. So it was pretty big. Um, and that was a big challenge for me. It was, it was my first project of this size. Actually, the, that was, I think the biggest project. Okay, so let's dive into tiny particles um, and look at auto jointing. So I'll do this, I'll try to explain. And if I start over explaining, um, you know, just 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 write like can you can you speed up a little? Can you speed up a little bit? Um, we know how this works, right? Or if I'm just, or if you have any question, you know, just uh, say so. Um, okay. So you guys next, I guess. We will see right now how good TP is on R&D level. Um, Okay, so what do we have here? We have a scene um, that mimics a destruction scene. And our destruction scene is going to be a collider colliding into an asset. And the asset can be a building or a ship or whatever you want, a house, um, the ground, whatever you want, a bridge. And basically what we want is that Wherever this guy, the sphere, which is our collider, comes close to our asset, which are these panels, these little boxes here, um, that they they get activated around the sphere and start dynamically simulate. But they shouldn't just be um, dynamically simulating um, uh, and falling. They should actually connect to the structure around them. And we, we get the feeling that this is like, you know, they're like strong. They try to fight the collision. They don't just get pushed away. Um, so we have a very simple, just a sphere, and it's moving through this plane. And the plane is spinning, which is a, 
only for demonstration that it does it wherever the sphere gets close and it's not like you know preset it's it's dynamically activating everything um oh actually so why joints why constraints in the identity system um if you have as i mentioned if you have a, a simulation and you have something colliding usually um structures try to stay together they don't just fall apart like a, like a cookie it just it tries to stay and be strong i mean otherwise every earthquake would just we would all just you know all the buildings would just be flat but the buildings they have like inner structure and they even if it's swaying it starts it tries to stay together so i have uh, again two videos just demonstrating uh, what i mean by that okay so here we have a simulation and there's a building crashing into another building and basically what happens is the moment it activates pieces uh, they go into orbit simulation and basically it just falls apart and we all know this looks kind of nice and cool but that's not really happening in the real world so what's what's more likely to happen in the real world is something like this All right. So as you see, it still falls apart, but it's all holding together and tries to defy falling apart. So it's still a weak building, but it kind of, you know, it tries to hold together. And this is the exact same building with roughly 8,000 pieces. Um, and the simulation took about, I want to say like an hour and a half, which is fairly fast. Um, so you can put, output a lot of iteration during the day. Okay. Why I'm still using Max 2014? Um, I like it. I don't need the new stuff, but it's just my preference. And I don't want to update every single year. It gets complicated. Um, okay. Back to Max. So this is why why joints um you guys see the screen again is it moving okay and you have seen the video right of the building collapsing but staying staying together okay good all right thanks for the feedback guys this is awesome <clears throat> um okay so let's have a look at the system. And instead of building it from scratch, I'm going to turn off everything and I'm just going to go step by step and explain exactly what is happening. Um, yeah. So. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> we see we have these boxes and basically they're, they're standing for um, pre-fractured objects. So let's say we have it and we cut it where we need to, and we want the cracks to kind of, you know, try to stay together, but then, you know, when they break, they, fall, uh, they break where the cuts are. So I just use boxes because it's very simple. It's very stable simulations. Um, and as you can see, there's a red and the green color. And the red and the green color is material IDs. So red is one and green is two, uh, ID two. And basically I do this because I'm going to use particles that are going <clears> to <throat> be sensors. And I only need the sensors in the cracks of the building, where the building is the weakest, where it's going to break. I don't need it on the outer, or outer surface. And if you're working with sensor particles, you're saving a lot, a lot of uh, memory and simulation time if you first prepare your asset and define where the sensor particles are going to be. Otherwise, I mean, look at, if you look at it, there's way, it seems like there's much more red surface than green. Um, I mean, that's probably not true. There's like a lot of gaps, but anyway, we're saving all of this red surface area to not be included in the simulation for uh, sensor emitting. Okay, so let's go into TP and TP is on.
And before we even start, I'll just turn everything off. <coughs> And we'll have a look at the group three first. So when you, um, I think I skipped another point in the, in, uh, yeah, there we go. I just started and it says big here, think first. So let's think what we want to do. Um, when you approach effects, um, it, it feels, yeah, like I just did like you want to rush it and you want to just jump into it and do it. And it's easy for me now because it's already set up and I did it already. But let's say this is the first one we want to do this. Um, we have to think about what are we going to do and how can we get there in the most efficient way. So <clears throat> um, I'll just go on the whiteboard and we'll say, okay, we have these boxes the green area and there's no colors either oh, actually yeah, green so we have these two particles and we know these are two fragments so what we want to do is we want to make them connect together so we want to create connections or basically they need to be connected but if you have a connection like this just from center to center um, you have a connection but this connection it can rotate right it can move in a spherical way around it this is not how things usually do like if if you think about a building it has rebar it has this metal structure inside and usually this metal structure is you know everywhere so what you want to do is you want to create connections uh, like, like a seam in a pullover, basically. Um, so <clears throat> how, we want to get, how, how do we want to approach this? How can we detect uh, points on the surface um, between, between two pieces? Um, this is something where it's not very easy um, to do with code because you you basically have to create sample points and um, you know if you do that with a code you might overdo it you don't see your points but with particles it's very easy you have visual representation of sample points you can control where to do them how many and you can also test positions so it's very you're building your own code so to say so what makes sense to do is just put points on all sides and we put those in a special group and then all of these points are going to search for the same group and basically establish a connection in memory between themselves and then that way we can we we have full control of what these points are going to do they can measure distance they can measure angles they can say what is the, the average position between each other and they also know what particle they're sitting on so this is exactly what I like to do when I do auto jointing systems. So um, let's go back to Max and look at the group tree. So now I demonstrated my thinking and we're going to do it in TP. So <clears throat> when we set up a tree, a group tree, we again, we need to think what are we going to do? What, what elements are we going to have? So we're going to have a ground where stuff is going to fall on and collide with. We're going to have our collider, which is our sphere. So we have the ground, we have the sphere uh, here. And we have our boxes, right? So for all the three, we have groups here. But we also know, OK, these guys, they're going to be, um, the ground is going to be static. Um, so he's not going to move and anything that touches the ground is not going to affect the ground. So the ground is going to be neutral. So we're going to have neutral objects uh, or unyielding objects or kinema uh, yeah, kinematic objects. Um, and then at the same time, the boxes are going to be activated because they're going to be pushed around. So we know we're going to have an active group, a group that is being pushed away by other particles. So we can definitely say, okay, we need a... Uh, 
a neutron and an active group. So neutron means in thinking particles, something that affects in a, in a rigid body dynamics uh, simulation, it affects other pieces, but it doesn't get affected by those pieces. So this is called neutron in thinking particles. And then if we go into those groups, in the shape collision dynamics, we can see they're set to neutron here. Um, and then if we go to the active ones, we can say they're active. Um, and then we know, okay, we're gonna do a rigid body simulation. So I personally always call this an SC group. And then I put everything inside that group. And then I can say, do a rigid body simulation on the group SC for shape collision. And basically <clears throat> that way I encapsulate everything that is affected by the solver inside there. But I have full control over every single one to set up different dynamics. And then what I like to do is create a helper group. And basically inside there, I put all the particles that are going to give me information or, you know, visualization particles or, you know, like anything that I don't necessarily want to uh, render or output at the end, but it's just there for helping. So since we said we're going to create uh, sensor particles, um, I call them seeds. And they're basically seeds sitting on the surface. And we know that the sensor particles are going to be on the collider. So we create collider seeds. We have uh, activation seeds, basically. So what we're going to do is here, we're going to say there are going to be seeds on, on the sphere and seeds on the boxes. And when they get close together, they're going to activate the boxes. So we're going to have activation seeds. And then we're going to have inactive seeds, which have not been activated yet. And then we're going to have active seeds, which have been activated. And <clears throat> we do this so the seeds on the collider, actually, I can turn this on. Well, this is great. All right, hold on for a sec. Um, for some reason, I can't see any particles. There we go. Okay, it was just a display issue. So I was forcing this setting and then I unclicked show mesh. So everybody, everything was disappearing, but it was still there. It was just like, I messed up the viewport. Anyways, um, so back to activation seats. Um, we have the collider seats, which are these red ones. And then we have these dark green ones here sitting on the surface. And basically what we want to do is say like, well, if one of you guys gets close to one of these guys, then activate you know, the, the, activate the seats and the shape that you're sitting on. And if I turn that on, um, step through. You can see it activates exactly where the sphere is. I'll, don't worry, I'll go back to step by step. I just wanted to make the point of activation seats. Um, so that way, <clears throat> we're not looking by pivots, we're looking by actually surface to surface. So if you have a shape that is like this, it doesn't matter where the pivot is, if it's here in the center, it doesn't matter if, it's, uh, if it gets close to here, it's still distant from the center, right? But because they're close to the surface, this, the particle here would be activated. Um, I hope you guys have seen that on the camera, on the camera view. Um, anyways, seed activation is surface to surface activation versus pivot to pivot. It just gives you more precision. All right, so <clears throat> we are importing, so we have uh, this red notes here in the import dynamics. And basically, what that means is 
these guys, the red nodes in thinking particles, are usually particles emitters. And this special one is called object to particle. And basically, that's exactly what it does. It takes an object from max that you pick, and it turns it into a particle. And then it gives you the option to track and to instance shapes. So um, if, I, if I take the collider and I set um, this off, you can see it puts a particle where the pivot is, but it doesn't create the shape around it. And then it lets me to instance this shape. And for TP, this is very important because it needs to know what to deal with um, when it does RBDs. Okay, and then <clears throat> we go into the seats dynamic sets. I will talk about the memory at last in a second. Um, we go to the seats dynamic set and we basically emit these guys on the surface. Now let's have a look how this works. So we're taking the collider and the collider is our sphere. And we're saying, hey, collider on particle birth. So particle age set to born, which is basically the moment he gets created, do emit new particles. So this time we have a position born. And basically position born is just creating particles at the incoming particles position. Or if you want, you can pipe in a position here or the way I do it, I emit them first and then I overwrite the position. So basically what we're doing here is saying on birth, emit particles and emit them on the position that the surface position calculates. So it says like, I'm calculating for the incoming particle, I'm calculating a new position on the incoming particle shape. So the collider, the sphere is the shape and the particle is the particle we're calculating the position for. And then it just outputs a position. And then we're taking this position and piping, piping it into the position operator, which is a orange node. And basically all it does, it overrides the position for the incoming particles. So now they're sitting on the surface. And then we have this little setup here where we're saying, okay, we want to use the surface area of the sphere. So how big is the surface? And we want to multiply that by a number, which is 10 here. So surface area, uh, surface by area, seats per area, or amount per area, or, or units, square unit, whatever. And this is the amount we want. So shot is set um, to pistol shot means do that just once. Don't do it per frame, do it once. Um, so if I change this number, you can see the particle amount is changing. Okay. And finally, we have one more node here, which is the memory node. And now I can explain to you what the memory master dynamics it does. So first, what we're doing here, we are, um, for every single red particle, we're saving the information from which particle they come from. By default, this doesn't do it, but the memory lets you save any kind of data that is in thinking particles. So all of these data types, it lets, to, it lets you save this data to the emitted particle or the incoming particle, which is in this case, the particle that comes out of here. And basically what it saves is a, come on, is a particle data type. So I've called it my shape particle. This is a name that you can choose freely. And it basically saves the particle data type, which is just an ID. So it saves this guy's ID to these particles. And they, they will remember that from now on. <clears throat> so I'm doing this because as you see right now, this collider is moving, but the seeds are not because they're not being told to. And then if you go to the very bottom here, we have a P attached dynamic set. And if I enable this, I'm taking this seeds particles. And again, here, a great demonstration of group nesting. We're saying all the seeds, all these groups, all of them, they, I expect them to have my shaped particles because I know seeds are being born on the surface of something. And I'm saying like, give me the ID of, of your saved shaped particle and then attach yourself to his, uh, to his animation. So basically now, if I turn this on, as you see, they're following. And they're basically following this guy's pivot animation. So the point, not the surface. So this node is for matrix multipli multiplication and not for surface uh, deformation. All right. 
So that's why why are we say, uh, why we are saving or using memory nodes, and <clears throat> the memory master is being created because you need to define. So if I create a memory, we have a new memory, and if I rename this guy, so new memory node. We have this guy, and basically inside him, we can create new attributes, right? Um, so there's a new attribute. And we can you know, expose this and we can override it. And basically whatever particle comes in here, it's gonna, set, it's gonna have this attribute saved to it. But there's a problem. If I go and I just start copying this node, what happens is, as you can see, it, it defines the same variable three times because we copy the node that defined the variable. And this can be very dangerous because you have the same name, same name of the node. And if you're now later down in the tree and you want to query this information and you're now here, how do you know to which attribute, which of the tree here, or which of the tree of this tree have you saved it? You don't know it. So what I like to do is I like to create one node where I define all the, uh, the containers that I can save data to. And I do that in the memory master. And inside there, I don't do anything else because now down the tree, I can call this guy and I know there's only one variable I can save to. And you know I can get this information out. So just a short intro uh, into memory nodes. I hope that was clear. Um, I think there's quite a lot of tutorials in the internet about that too. So let's keep moving. All right, so now that we have seats on the surface of the collider, let's have a look at um, seats on the boxes. And instead of using this big plane of boxes, I'm going to use the test environment, which is just this small one here, just so we get faster feedback. Um, again, if you guys say this is too slow, move a little faster, or this is too fast, go a little slower, just let me know. Okay, so basically inside the activation seat burst here, I have the exact same setup with the only difference that I'm taking the neutron boxes from the neutron here and I'm emitting into the group inactive. But everything is the same, and as you can see, even though it's a different group, it still saves the shape particle, but this time it saves this guy, which has emitted <coughs> um, the, the dark green particle. So the dark green particles save the green shapes, while the reddish particles save the purple collider. And then that way, they're all following. So if I now turn on here, um, object to particle tracking, you can see everyone is following uh, its, its correct shape. And that's really great about thinking particles. You can just do everything dynamic. Um, I currently have TP6 installed. So the, the same version, the latest version that is available publicly. And now it is independent of Max. Um, all of this is very basic and can be done with TP, I think all the way back to TP 3.5. So I hope I didn't say anything wrong. At least TP 4 can for sure do it. Um, okay. So now that we have seats on both, um, what we want to do is we want to. Um, activate, right? So we want to make sure when this guy gets close to this guy's, turn the activation on. And as you see so far, there was pretty much no math. There was, there was no math involved. There was nothing complex so far. Okay, so the next step is the collapses, which are these red particles, are going to search for the green ones. So it's called p-search. And basically, um, we're saying search for the inactive uh, seats, which is these guys, and search in this radius. And instead of activating yourself, uh, I'm going to turn 
the animation off. Instead of activating the seats, activate the shape that the seats are sitting on. And I'll do this for a very special reason. Um, if I would activate this seat, this side of the seats might not get activated, especially if you have like big objects or big particles with big shapes and complex shapes, you know, that go, I don't know, somewhere. You want to say like, well, once the shape is activated, I want all the other guys that are sitting on it also to be activated so they don't go into the search function again and just cause unnecessary uh, computation time. So uh, because of that, I say like the first seed that gets activated, activate your shape. And then in the next dynamic set here, I say, and you, you see the moment I turn it on, it turned everything turned green. So I'm saying like, well, you inactive guys, now you go and check after the shape has been activated, check, give me my shape, check what group is the shape in, is it in the active boxes group? Well, if so, then activate myself too, which is I'm the seed, right? And then that way, whenever this guy gets activated, all the other guys on that shape get activated too. And that saves us again, a lot of computation, like searching um, computation time. So now that we have that, everything is getting activated dynamically. It doesn't matter. We, may, we know that it's going to get activated the moment it gets closer. So collision is going to, uh, you know, it's going to get into collision and it's going to work. So actually, I'm going to demonstrate that. So we're going to turn this guy on. Oh, don't crash. All right. And done. So we know it's getting activated and <clears throat> From the rotational force, stuff is flying away. And now if we turn on gravity and shape collision and hit play, you can see there's a collision happening. Everything's falling on the ground. And it's all happening dynamically. Very, very simple. OK. So now this is a basic RBD setup. Yes, we will get to that. Uh, sorry, can you determine determine the number of joints particles proportional to the area of the surface? To some degree, yes. Um, we'll see that in a second. Oh, there's more questions. All right, one second. Are they all attached together? Um, no, so far nothing is attached. Can you do this? Um, for TP, your foundation has to start strong, so it doesn't matter if you did not start with latest TP61. Okay. No, we're not activating by volume. We're activating by distance between the two surfaces, or basically the distance between the particles that sit on the surfaces of the different shapes. So um, let me draw that on the whiteboard again. So let's say we have a shape like this, and then we have our sensor seat particles sitting on the surface. And then here, let's say the pivot of this particle is here, right? Because it's fairly in the center. So now we have our collider coming. And let's say our collider comes from here. And he also has seeds. Um, they are here. Now the distance between the seeds or the surfaces is this, right? While the distance between the pivots is really big. So we're saying we're not going the distance between um, surfaces, uh, sorry, pivots or volumes. Well, you could call it volumes, but actually it's the distance between the surface positions. Doing it by volumes would be actually more expensive, except you have a really low voxel uh, count. Yes, I will release the scene later. 
Um, cool. Awesome. Back in Max. Um, so the next step is now the RBD collision is done, right? It's super simple and you can now destroy whatever you want. Um, next step would be to um, create a jointing. And to create a jointing, uh, the constraints or the joints, what we need to do First guys get activated. So it, what happens, they're getting activated and now they're going to fall. Gravity is going to pull on them, collision is going to happen. So we know, okay, this is the moment we have to connect um, to, the envir to, the, to the other geometry. So basically what we have to say is, hey, you green guys, search for green guys and start connecting. So this is exactly what we're doing here. So find the two active. And basically what we're doing is, uh, so we're saying active particles, which are the green seeds, on particle age enters groups. So when you turn from dark green to bright green, meaning when you get activated, um, start searching for the same group. And you can see I, I connected this group to this group. Um, basically, I'm transferring the group before I was picking it here. So it doesn't matter how you do it. I just did it like this in this case. And basically I'm saying, okay, active, search for active. Bright green, search for bright green within this radius. And whatever particle you find, emit a joint particle, which is a red tick. Uh, I mean, a red particle. <clears throat> and I'm doing this on the average position. So here I have a little dynamic set and inside I have a, a vector addition. So I'm adding one position to the other position. And then in this uh, vector operator, I'm basically multiplying the incoming position by 0.5 on X, Y, and Z. So basically position A plus position B times uh, 0 0.5 to get the average. And if I turn that on, we will hopefully, there we go, see red, uh, red particles. Now, we have a connection, right? So this green guy is connected to green. Well, they're not connected yet. They just know about, uh, they found about themselves and they created a particle in between them. Um, but what we also can see, we can see red particles here between those two. And this is pointless, right? Because they're sitting on the same shape. Why would they create a connection? So what we have to do is we have to make sure you only connect to the guys that are not sitting on the, on, on yourself, like on, on your shape. Find only the guys that are on the neighbor shape. So <clears throat> what we have here is a little expression. And the expression says um, the particle ID that comes in, like particle ID A and particle ID B, we give it two IDs, two integer numbers. And we're saying, well, if, if A is equal B, then that means we're on the same particle with the shape, like on the same box, then output zero. But if, it's, if we're not, the IDs are not the same, then it output one, meaning we're on a different shape. And if I connect this, um, then you see the connection only happen between the two or uh, the, the green pieces that are sitting on different orange boxes. So now we have a pretty clean col um, connection. <clears throat> and we are, again, we are using the memory to call what particle are we sitting on? We're not comparing seed to seed. We're comparing the shapes that we're sitting on. Um, and then I added another expression. 
um, to make sure we don't have a double connection. So if, if this guy is searching for this guy, he's going to connect. But then later, because they're in the same group, this guy is going to search for this guy and he's going to find him again. And he's also going to connect. So I added another condition here that says, um, and, and this time we're, we're comparing the two seed IDs. And we're saying, hey, if A is smaller than B, then that means this connection has not been done yet. But if it's if if uh, if A is not smaller than B, the connection already exists. And here's why. I said in the beginning, all the groups are sorted. Um, it goes from zero to you know up, like zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And let's say let's say this guy is zero and this guy is one, right? So it's going to go zero, search for all the green particles. And it goes like, okay, I'm searching for one, for two, for three. I'm zero, right? I'm searching for one, two, three. And I'm finding, let's say, three. Three is, uh, three is up here, let's say. So zero and three. And then we create that connection. And now the next particle's turn in this group, uh, it, it's the turn for the next particle in this group, which is one to search for all the other ones. So it goes one searches for all of them, two searches for all of them, and then comes three, particle three. And three searches for all of them, and all of them means zero included. So it says, oh, I found three finds zero down here. I want to connect to it because it's in my distance or in, in my range of connection. And then we have to have a condition that says, oh, wait a minute, but I already am connected to this guy. And because it's going from zero up, we can say, well, if I am bigger, my number is bigger than the one that I'm connecting to, that means that this guy already found me when, when it was his turn to search. So that way, we're just making sure we have single connections and no double connections. All right, I hope that wasn't too much, um, and I hope it was clear. So now that we have that, we can move on. <clears throat> so the question before, can you determine how many connections per surface area? Well, first of all, the more seeds you have on the surface area, the more particles gonna find each other. So if I go to activation seed birth and I increase this number, you can see the number of the red particles is increasing as well. Um, and then what I implemented um, for this exact reason is uh, I have a reduce joints function. And basically here, once the red guys have been created, I'm going in there and you see what happened? It, it reduced the amount. And basically what I did is exactly the same. I'm saying red particles on when you get born, search again for yourself. So I'm not piping in the group again, um, within a spacing um, that I define. So if I go bigger, we get less. And I'm saying now, again, if, if, if the searching particle IDs is smaller than the found particle IDs, then this connection is new. And in that case, take the found uh, red particle and throwing, throw him into the delete group. <clears throat> and I'm also deleting the particle as well. And this here is just, uh, it's, a, it's a double security kind of thing. I mean, I could just throw it into the group and then this delete group, basically I can say don't get cash, um, but the particles are still there. But since I know I will not use them, I also delete them. Um, I do not just delete them because if I just delete them, deletion happens always on the next sample. The particle is still there. It's still in this group, but it's marked to be deleted. But that doesn't mean that in dynamic sets following this rule, this particle is not in the group, so it will still uh, calculate in some cases. So this is just like a security thing. So I throw them into another group, and then after this dynamic sets, this particle is not in the group, and it's not going to be calculated anymore. It's just a security thing. It's not very important for you right now. Um, so I have two controls to control how many um, points I have for the joints. One is the amount of seats on the surface. This gives me also more precision. And then I'm reducing, so I don't have two joints that are very close to each other. 
it just speeds up simulation a lot. Because even if I have a small number here, if I have, let's say, 10, and I reduce the joints, maybe that was, yeah, you can still have two that are really close to each other, but then no other ones, right? So this just reduces so you have like a proper space. So if we turn this on now, I'll just do this. Uh, I'll do crash. Okay. Max can uh, sometimes when you force it to calculate a lot at the same time, it can just close. So, <clears throat> and I'm on edit on the fly, which means whenever I do something in thinking particles, it immediately calculates. Um, it's not a very good thing to do when you have bigger systems, but with an R&D system, it's usually not that you know dangerous. And I mean, the saves, uh, the scene is saved, so it's fine. Um, but that way I can just scrub numbers and I see the feedback right away, which is very good for demonstration purposes. Um, so yeah. So if we run this simulation now, you can already tell these particles have been connected. Um, they're staying together. If I turn the joints off, you see they immediately start separating. And then when they fall, well, they haven't separated that much yet. But um, if I make the activation radius smaller, they will collide with the sphere. And you can see they're all, they're all separating. But if I turn on the joints, they try to stay together. And now if I increase um, the number 25, you see, they, they, they're aware of the neighboring shapes and they stick together. Okay, um, we still are facing a little problem here. We are connecting the active ones together. And you can tell they're trying to stick together, but nothing is connecting to the remaining shape. Um, so what we need to do as well is we just have to make sure that the green ones, the bright green ones also search and connect to the dark green ones. And here again, we are um, same as act setup, like it's exactly the same setup. The only difference is that we're taking active group and instead of the group input here, I picked the inactive group and now um, everything else is the same. And now I can even choose a bigger radius to make a stronger connections. So the joints are stronger to the remainder, remainder of the shape than to, um, you know, between the active ones. So the active ones can break apart, but the connection to the big part of the, the shape is stronger. And now if I run this simulation, As you see, the whole thing tries to stay together. All right. So we have the reduce joints to make sure the separation is working. And for some for some reason, I'm always looking to this side because there's my camera view, but actually the camera's here. Okay. Um, <coughs> so this, anyways, um, it's just me being just confused. Anyways, um, so the reduced joint, and then finally we have a, a joint creation setup. And now we can just take this red particle. Oh, I forgot one thing, right? Um, whenever we're creating the red particle, we're saving information to him because he needs to know he's going to be triggering the actual constraint. So he needs to know, okay, who am I going to constraint or joint together? And that is going to be here. Um, should I make this big? So 
what we're going to do is we're going to take the searching particles shape that he's sitting on and put that the joint from shape. So this information here, and then we're going to go, go to the found particles shape that he's sitting on, the found particle is sitting on, and we're going to say that this is the two jointing shapes. So we have this two memory nodes. And then just so when the particles are moving, the joint uh, particle keeps following. We don't actually need that. It's just like nicer to see. Um, we also save the actual shape particle of the searching one into its my shape particle. So we don't have to have another rule here in the P attach where the particle is being attached to its shape. So that way we just have one setup and everything flows. But one could argue that this is double um, double memory usage. But since we're still, you know, we could just attach him to the from or to the two shape and it would work fine. <clears throat> um, since we have a small set system, there's no worry about memory right now. Okay, so now we know that the red particle knows who he has to connect. Um, and then we can go to the joining and basically say, okay, whenever the red particle Okay, so whenever the red particle gets born, give me the from joint from shape and joint to shape, and then we take the shape collision uh, joint SC joint shape collision joint creator, and we say, okay, which shape collision do you want to use, and which joint type do you want to use? So I, for kind of bending stuff, you can use ball joints because they are spherical joints, but they try to get together if you give them a friction. And then here's the joint data <clears throat> where you can set, okay, is the joint breakable? Uh, what is the threshold that it's going to be breaking on? And how much friction, how much force? It's, it's kind of confusing naming here. But basically, the friction says, how much does it try to get back? And basically, that's all you need to know. Um, so whenever he gets created, we just give him particle from, particle to, these are the two boxes, and which position is the joint going to be at. And basically that means if I go to the whiteboard, it just says like, okay, if we have, whatever, if we have a particle here, and then we have another seat here, and then we have colors. Um, we have the joint created particle, which is our red guy here. We say like, where is this joint, right? So we have a pivot here and we have a pivot here. You guys are seeing the dashboard, right? Yes. Um, so basically we're saying the connection goes like this. So it goes from the pivot to this guy and from this guy to this guy. So this is the connection. So these are the two axes that it's, it's trying to rotate around. And because we have so many of them, it's like they're all trying to rotate, but they're kind of evening themselves out. So it gives you a really, really cool simulation and very, very stable. Um, so this is the world position. Um, at least that's how I understand it. Um, and yes, and that's basically the whole system. So we turn on the forces, the gravity. So all active boxes, only active particles going to have gravity, that gravity direction, gravity force. Um, 47.5 seems to work really well for me. It just looks good. It has nothing physical, uh, really. And um, it just kind of feels natural, like the gravity, as I mentioned before. Sometimes, you know, you want to do 9.8, but then that's not strong enough. You have to have the feeling when you see it. Does it, does it feel like you know, a real collision? And, and then we have the shape collision. And the shape collision basically, this is the RBD solver, basically says, okay, which is the group that I need to solve collisions on? 
and then we choose to shape collision here. And basically that means everything inside that group is going to be considered for uh, rigid body dynamics. But because we have set the, the properties on the groups, we can say which one are yielding and which one are not, are unyielding, so to say. And then <clears throat> I like to start with settings of 30 and 15. It just kind of, it's a good average between um, accuracy and speed. And then I, I, if usually I activate all the particles because then they didn't just don't freeze when, uh, when they reach this deactivation thresholds. Um, works for me most of the time. So this is it. I mean, that's the whole system of, actually let's turn on the bigger part and let's turn off the ticks. There you go. And now if I play this, it should be fairly fast. Um, the joints don't seem to be very strong right now. Uh, but also consider, so we have we have some joints. Oh, sorry guys, I'm uh, still on the whiteboard. Okay. Oof. I think I have to go all the way back to SC jointing, right? Okay, so we have joints. The joint particle on birth gives output between the two um, from shape and to shape. And then here we have the average position. So that's what I mentioned before. Um, and these are the settings. And this is it. This is all it takes to create joints procedurally. Um, and then we have a force, boxes, direction, strength, and the shape collision. So again, here's the group that we choose. Um, we choose um, to operate on, to be considered for rigid body dynamics. So inside here, all of these groups. And then down here, I set 30 for collisions and 15 for contact iterations. And I activate all the particles. Um, so that's it. And now, if I play this again, we can see there's not much um, connection happening, a little bit. And this has mainly to do because our activation radius is very small. So there's not much bending space. So the sphere actually pushes so strong that it breaks the particles off right away. So if I turn the activation radius a little bit bigger, You can see there's a lot of bending happening. Not everything is breaking off. And the coolest part is because there's joints between the active spaces, whatever breaks off still tries to stick together. It gives a very natural feeling. So <clears throat> this is an R&D scene, right? And it's, it's very simple and kind of boring, but it gives you super fast feedback on your R&D. Like, I mean, it's almost real time. You can just play around. Now you can just take that setup, save it, and apply it on a big, uh, a bigger setup. So um, um, before I do so, um, do you have any questions? Did you like that, or do you think, oh man, what, why is he simulating little boxes here? Oh wow, that's a big question. Um, all right. Okay, how do you deal with jointed RBD sim explosions? Usually more joints equal more unstable sim. Um, energy, energy is accumulating in the system and this leads to explosion. My way to deal with it, increase friction in the system for energy decay and keep max joint amount per particle as low as possible. Exactly, that's exactly why there is a reduce joint uh, setup and also the control how many points you have on the scene. So you're on definitely on the right track. Uh, do you have any tips about this problem? Is there any way to analyze energy distribution in the system? Said that you see SC can't give you impulse value for the collided particles. 
Um, um, I can't watch the video right now for the question. Um, but uh, maybe maybe we can address this question later. Um, but for now, yeah. So if you have a lot of energy accumulating, um, let's have a look. So you do have impact position and you do have um, particle A and particle B colliding. <clears throat> so in theory, you can figure out like, for example, okay, what are the two velocities and what is the surface? I mean, you even have the seeds, right? So you can take the velocity from the seeds that are close to that position and then you can get some kind of energy out of that. But to be honest, this very mathematical thing might work in some cases. Usually it's just figuring out the number. It's just like, you know, a little bit less, a little bit more, find the balance. Um, because in some cases you might have like a very strong impact and then, um, you know, you're gonna have like really fast collisions. In some cases, you might just have something that's really slow spinning, but the tension is really getting great and just explodes. So as you, as you said, reduce the amount um, and then move up from there until you get a good result before it's exploding. And then also what I really, really suggest, like what I had a lot of this explosion kind of stuff happening is uh, when you have complex cuts, like when you have like shapes like this and you have joints everywhere in between, right? So shape collisions try to solve, joints are trying to hold it together, it becomes really complex. But if you have like flat surfaces, the joints have, you know, they have a much simpler um, area or basically um, task to calculate. So help to shape collision out because it's a complex calculation that needs to do. So help the collision, shape collision solver out by reducing the amount of detail on the simulation geometry. You can still later, you can take this exact same shape and replace their shape with a complex geometry. And that's gonna speed up your simulations, make it stable. And, you know, yeah, and make it easier for you too. I mean, so you just need a little bit more preparation time. This is what I would suggest. And this is what I like to do. It's just like, you know, spend more time on the preparation. And then the, I know what the system likes and can do. And that way I can prepare it for the system. And I know, okay, the system's just gonna give me my results that I want. Um, okay. I'm having a bad experience in mixing SC joint types in one system. Let's say fixed to hold RBDs and spherical to bend after fixed breaks. Um, to be honest, I never tried both of them. I have always have satisfied results um, with one or the other. Yes, you can, you can per particle, you can um, define which joint type. So here's a joint type. And basically, if I'm not wrong, zero, uh, sorry, here. So here's a type. So if I'm not wrong, zero is uh, spherical and then goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Actually, I think zero, uh, one is spherical and then six is ball joint, if I remember right. It's been a while. But uh, I think you can. You can also here just set the type and then just go like um, integer. But yeah, if you had bad experience with different joint types, I mean, sometimes, you know, um, you might want to activate the, the, let's say, what did you say, spherical and fixed. You want to activate the, 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 the spherical joints only when the fixed joint actually breaks. Um, so you, you don't have a fixed and the spherical at the same time trying to do their stuff. But yeah, this is, a, this is a more complex question. I would have to dig into that. I haven't tested that. Um, I have a better, okay. 
Yeah. Um, but yeah, any other questions? Uh, has anything been unclear so far or everything good? Okay, when will I start optimizing my system? Well, as I said, I actually, even before I start simulating, usually um, from experience, I know, as I said, complex fragment shapes is going to cause me trouble. So I try to optimize it as much as I can before I even enter Tinky particles. Um, and I'm not saying like I'm not building the system before I have the asset optimized. I'm just saying like before the asset enters Tinky particles, it should be as optimized as possible. Help the system to give you the result that you're expecting. Don't expect, you know, the world. Uh, or the, the, the whatever, everything being solved by TP, you know, think about about your setups. And um, when do I start optimizing? So first of all, yeah, always optimize, but um, depends on what you're doing. I mean, if you, if you need to do, I mean, this is now TP independent. If you need to do a tidal wave, but your camera is like, you know, right at the water surface and you have to have this whole simulation. I mean, maybe you shouldn't simulate. You need to think about how you approach the effect. Um, I think you, you, you gauge that by how much time do you have to the deadline? I mean, how many resources do you have? Do you have like a lot of RAM? Do you have really strong CPUs? Can you deal with everything being procedural or do you, are you running out of time and resources and then you have to optimize? I personally, I really like real-time feedback as much as possible and you know well you saw it right now i'm changing numbers and it, it just keeps popping so i like that a lot but sometimes it's not possible and um you know the the quicker the better roughly an hour to two that's the patience i have to wait for simulations after that i'm like oh man i'd rather split it in two or you know have a testing environment and just just test it on a, on a small portion, make sure this looks good and then apply it on the rest. So, yeah, you know, time is valuable and uh, an hour or two lost per day just because you're too lazy to make a lot of tweaks, that's um, a lot. I will, uh, I will release the scene files um, later, I'll put them online. Can we, uh, how long did it take you to get good at thinking particles? Um, I don't know. I mean, you constantly keep learning. Uh, I think it actually had two attempts. The first time I saw thinking particles, I didn't understand it um, because I was, you know, I was still in PFLOW, PFLOW world. Um, and then I think two, three weeks later, I tried it again and then it clicked, it just like went, okay, so this is simple, I can use it, I just need to be, you know, changing my way of thinking. But that was before, you know, I started like, I didn't even understand that we are in a coordinate system with X, Y, Z, when, when I was like, I was just kind of didn't realize that. And then I was, suddenly I started thinking, oh wait, this is something I learned in school, there's some math in there. Oh my God, this is, that's how it works. And then TP is, you know, it just kind of became much easier because, yeah, gotta think about what you're doing. 